Um, everyone's get together. It's a really exciting panel called Voicing the Self, Readings of Creative Nonfiction and Poetry. And our first um, presenter is Harper Oreck from Polytechnic. Hi, so I'm Harper, I'm from Poly, and so I'm going to be presenting a poem today called In Which I Trace the First Mutation, and just to give a little background on this poem, I wrote it for my poetry class last semester, and the prompt that we had been given for this poem was to write about the body. And at the time, in my biology class, we were also studying genealogy and kind of looking at um, hereditary traits. So I wanted to, through this poem, kind of examine the linkage between the psychological conception of the self, that is to say, how we see our bodies and how we expect other people to perceive us, and the scientific study of genetics and the traits and how they manifest in, um, I guess, like physical form. And also I wanted to explore in this poem, because we were supposed to take a personal look at the body, um, the fact that I and my sister are both redheads and we both have blue eyes and our entire family um, doesn't share that, I guess. Like my grandparents, my parents, and my great-grandparents are all brunettes, they all have brown or green eyes, and so for us, it's always been kind of a running joke in the family of where do we get these traits? And I wanted to take a more kind of um, scientific look at this through the form of poetry, and so that's kind of what I did here. Um, so this is my poem in which I trace the first mutation. In the grocery store, a man my grandfather's age stops me to ask what part of Ireland my people are from, and right there, by the cereals and granola bars, I think of the genetic test we poured over, returned with Ireland highlighted in red, and Scotland highlighted in red, and Russia and Belarus and the Ukraine highlighted in red, all of the wires crossed, and say I wouldn't know, which is a simplification, but not a lie. To summarize a perennial question in a sentence, I leave out parts about unlikely Jewishness and Punnett squares and the inextricable genealogy of conquer. In a collage of recalled memories, I am always stopped in the grocery store. After all, my mother wears her hair like a question, unmistakably brown between layers of highlights, and some people have to ask. If not my father, then who? If not a family heirloom, then what? If you hold an infant in front of a doctor and they say, remarkable, and give you ballpark odds, who is doing the real math? Where is the precision of genetics to close the gap? Always the same mystery. So, to save us both some time, I'll walk you through the steps. One, sift through family photographs, colorized, checking for flashes of red. Check for freckles left uncovered, check for eyes that aren't hazel, check for skin burning in the sun. Look specifically at cousins, uncles and aunts, extended families, your grandmother's friends, you'd be surprised. The markers are there, you just have to find them. The symptoms are there, you can feel them already. Two, look at the history books. Recessive, a pretty word, promises answers and fails us again. Go back to the winters, to each of the wars, roll out maps that left the villages unmarked, find the bodies in the snow, look at their hair, open the shattered doors of the temple loosened by battering rams, and check all of the frescoes, retrace your steps over the op open fields, past the shuttles and the revolutions before red found its home on the flag, Remember the Cossacks on their horses, spilling blood and blue eyes over the plains. Yes, the steps haven't shown me a history yet. And yes, one of these bodies will have my eyes and my hair and a name I can give when asked in the grocery store. But I don't know which one. In a step I left off the list, I held a crisp double helix over the fire and saw a flame tainted by sodium. The phenotype melting, nothing new on the chart. Maybe one day I will have a brunette baby and the gene will disappear again, symmetry restored, and naming the first mutation won't matter. Until then, follow the steps. Thank you. Next up is, whoop, correct. There you go. Sorry about that, Austin. Austin Astrup <coughs> from Crossroads, The Price of Tuition. Hello, my name is Austin Astrup, and I'll be giving an oral story titled The Price of Tuition, and then afterwards I'll give a brief explanation. So I was in eighth grade, and David, the middle school dean, called me into his office at lunch. 
And you see, usually when David the Dean calls you into his office, it's, it's not a good thing. It's because you're in trouble. You know, I took pride in being a good kid then, so while walking over, I couldn't understand, you know, what I could have done wrong. And I get to the office, and, you know, he opens the door, he, he points to the couch where I sit, and he says, Austin, I'd like to talk to you. You know, by now I'm like shivering, you know, what could I have done wrong? He says, Austin, I'd like you to speak at the eighth grade moving up ceremony. <laughs> I mean, not only was I relieved that I wasn't in trouble, but, you know, this was, has, was an opportunity that I wanted to have since I was in sixth grade, so... And of course I said yes, and I began writing the speech the next day. Three weeks later, the day of the ceremony finally arrives. My brother, who lives in New York, he flew in in the morning, and you know, we spent the whole day together rehearsing the speech, talking about old stories, listening to songs we used to love, you know, everything my brother and I do when he gets back in town. And at 3.30 that day, I had a mic check at my school. So I got to school, and I rehearsed my speech. It was feeling pretty good. You know, of course, I was anxious. But after the speech, my dad called me, and he asked who I was. And I told him, you know, I'm incredibly nervous, but also incredibly excited. And he said he was rooting for me, but he, he said he couldn't make it. And he didn't clarify why, but he apologized. And I knew my brother would be filming it, so I knew he'd still get the chance to see it. So I didn't even question it. And he hung up the phone. Then at about 4 o'clock, uh, friends and teachers started coming in. This is when my heart's beating about twice as fast. Then at 5 o'clock, the moment finally arrives. Austin Astrup, will you please come to the podium? I remember walking up to the podium, and as cheesy as it sounds, this was the moment I was waiting for. You know, I've been going to Crossroads since I was six years old, and now I had the opportunity to speak for the school that I was raised in. Without Crossroads, I said, I would not be who I am today. This school is full of love, kindness, and appreciation, and I couldn't imagine myself anywhere else. After the speech, friends and teachers started to congratulate me. Austin, you did such a good job, or I'm so happy you spoke. And it felt great. You know, I felt accomplished. But I was, uh, you know, driving home with my brother when I couldn't stop thinking about my dad not being there. And so I asked Aiden, um, do you know why dad couldn't come? And he looks at me and says, do you really want to know? And I nodded. And he said that dad couldn't come because he owed money to the school and since he couldn't afford to pay, and they'd been asking him to pay for a while, he didn't want to be confronted at the ceremony. You see, and there I was, nervous to speak for my school, a school that fosters a safe and comfortable learning environment, a school with incredible faculty and staff, a school with an acclaimed and respected curriculum, a school that cost almost $40,000, and a school that I couldn't afford to be in. I was chosen to represent my grade. I was chosen to represent the private school student. But is the private school student supposed to feel embarrassed to invite his friends over because his house is too small? Is the private school student supposed to ask his mom to drop him off two blocks away from school so his friends don't have to laugh at his old car? Is a private school student supposed to feel disadvantaged because he's not as wealthy as his peers? You know, every day I walk into school and I act like I belong. You know, I use an Apple computer, I hold an iPhone, I talk about ACT tutors just so my friends don't have to wonder if I'm on financial aid. And I am on financial aid. However, sometimes I feel like I'm still working to pay off the full tuition. You know, as I stand in front of you, Looking back at that moment in David's office, I wonder if I truly wanted to speak or if I unconsciously felt like I couldn't say no because I owed too much. You know, don't get me wrong. Independent schools are incredible. But you either have the money to be here or you constantly feel like you have to prove your worth. Thank you. So, according to the National Association of Independent Schools, 18.7% of private school students receive some sort of financial aid. And as you, I'm sure, know, this number is often celebrated, you know, validating a school's progression. You know, even when I went to visit colleges, I was constantly told the number of students there, they're on financial aid. It was used as this selling point. But I am more than just a percentage. 
You see, we spend so much time glorifying the statistics that we begin to ignore the individual experience. Because I am more than just a number. And that's why I tell my story, to prove that I'm a person. That my struggles and my issues as a student on financial aid are real. Thank you. Thank you, Austin. Next up is Helen Deverell from Polytechnic. Hi, I'm Helen. Uh, my title I it has pretty much nothing to do with what I'm about to read, but um, I liked the way it sounded, so I chose it. I'm going to read a couple poems today. Um, and the first one is called Time Spent Alone. Let me tell you a true story, one with a beginning, middle, and half of an end. In the portion of the story that I want to tell, we all lie in a circle near a new plot of land and play with sticks in the mud like small children or the very old. In the real version, there isn't a story at all, and in its place is a eulogy, possibly a tired valediction, maybe a simple goodbye, projecting itself on us like the plague. The field is replaced by a factory, the sticks by blocks of wood, and every one of us is reduced to nothing more than what we entered this world with. The common denominator, death, the beginning, gone, the middle, irrelevant. Here's the end. In a world without motherly love, the leaves don't crunch, don't crunch underfoot, and get this, the recidivism rates are still through the roof. Somewhere in New York, in a new time zone, in a quick contraction of muscle giving rebirth to continuity. The only living empath looks up at the moon, cries out for the trampled fern and the fish stuck in the ice block, and says, look, I conquer the city with thought. I cry to say that I've learned. When I was a different age, I thought that tacking my thoughts to a cork, bo to a cork board meant they'd materialize. Then one day, on my long walk home, I kicked a can and severed a worm's body in half, watched as it turned a new shade of pale, wriggled a bit, and then slowly died. In my current state, I've come to terms with one fact. Some thoughts are better than no thoughts at all. Here's one last thing. Imagine yourself into a new world, a new nest to maybe call your own or maybe mortgage. Now think of a number, double it, and you've got the new wheat fields, and you've got the new wheat fields planted off the I-95 next to the men from the south of the states who work to keep a kid in each arm. Um, this next one is called Poem, when I, Poem on Where I Went Wrong, and it has an epigraph by Richard Sykin, so I'll read that first. To be a bird or a flock of birds doing something together, one or many, starling or murmuration. To be a man on a hill, or all the men on all the hills, or half a man shivering in the flock of himself. These are some choices. Ask me, who wrote the book and called it good? And if it is good, who's to blame? Who is the quotable one? On our third date, you told me you collected bones. I don't collect anything, I said. And you pulled out a small mouse bone from your coat pocket and told me that I needed to start somewhere. That night, I dreamed that your stash of bones came alive, replaced all of the bones in your body, and turned you into a hairy, mean, manatee-like creature with the head of a small shrew. That reminds me, in a hundred years or less, I think the will to learn might become obsolete or at least outdated. In 200, I think we'll all be dead. The first time we met, you tried to woo me, twice. Originally, you told me you were an etymologist. I'm an etymologist, you said. That means I study words. OK, Hemingway, I thought, and tried not to laugh. The second time, you stopped to save a stray dog on the side of the highway. Watch this, you said. And instead of giving him back, you took the dog to a hay field a couple of miles out and set him free. Here are some things that I like music playing from another room, shower curtains made of maps, warmth, I guess, and words ending in ism. Here are some things I don't like, pantsuits or surprises, the female BMI, a host of incurable diseases. Apparently, the Spanish conquistadors missed their mothers on missions. Even back then, the earth turned, the sun shone, and men missed their mothers. But who misses the men? No one. At least we all still miss the rain. And I have a final one called, ha okay, it was originally titled, I saw that Denny sign and thought it was the moon, but I, uh, <laughs> I was like, all right, that's kind of trite. So I changed it to um, 
how to avoid an exodus and other life lessons. I think that maybe the Mayan woman from my church might have been right about something, as follows. It is all set in stone. Not to sound sad or pessimistic or overly philosophical, I just think that this lonely life might not be for me. If, in the end, it's all the same, what's the point of the second coming? What's the point of rising out of bed in the morning just to put on the same old socks? Chew on this. Aren't we better off living a life that's already been hand-drawn, dipped in wax, neatly tied with twine? A little while ago, maybe a week, I was reading this article about a bee that accidentally stung himself. Apparently, when his mother gave birth to him, or the egg from which he hatched more like, he came into the world with an ill-proportioned stinger, the unfortunate shape of a far-reaching S. First, I'm thinking some sad thoughts. Next thing I know, I'm crying. Look here, I yell to my father. Get this, I mean, fate-wise, that bee is fucked. <laughs> the next morning, when the small blue bee tried to employ the only thing in life presumably governed not by God but by insect, a bee's jurisdiction proper, he sent his stinger not north towards a predator or prey, but south, right into his very own ass. Which, in the scheme of things, didn't end up mattering all that much anyway. Herein, I think, lies the point, something we should all remember. Stop buzzing around like atoms under heat, is what I'd imagine this bee to say. Look, you're all going to die anyways. Just like altruism, clemency's a myth. Let me conclude with one final thought. I'm really not as sad as I seem. Sure, I try for the best, but if it all goes poorly, I console myself by remembering one small thing. If, in the year 1620, 80,000 Englishmen left their grubby homeland to pursue a new love, I tell myself, chances are that you should too. This is how I avoid an exodus, at least by the other party. To migrate, my mother taught me, you must move first. I think the bee would agree. Next up is Nicholas Green from Buckley School. Um, okay. Uh, I had originally written these two pieces of writing separately, uh, but there were factors within the two pieces of writing that seemed to gravitate to one, towards one another so perfectly, and that is the factor of race. It was uh, central to both pieces of writing. Although the style of writing switches quite often, the topic of race permeates throughout both of the writings. Okay. I'm heavily involved when it comes to diversity and equitable inclusion. It is something that automatically I must stay educated about. My ethnicity and my race make me stand out. If I were to remain uneducated about my standing in the world, it can make me susceptible to lies being fed to me through many outlets. Thankfully, I love learning about myself and others as well. I hope one day people won't be forced to be aware and the very real and current dangers will dissipate with time. A young woman moved by heroism and bravery stands defiant in front of the young enslaved boy. There's a dreadful spectral scream that echoes through the mountains and the valleys as an iron wolf comes down on the girl. The scream is one of agony and it lives within the country's history, yet no one seems ashamed, no one is appalled, no one is doing anything. For America's lifespan, it has been ignored. There have been attempts to cover it up and forget about it. However, like a river, this haunting flows over boundaries and barriers. Refusing to be ignored, this ghost is slavery. The haunting remnants of it are captured in Colson Whitehead's The Underground Railroad. For the enslaved, they could not attempt to hide or run away from their phantoms. For most of the enslaved, the ghosts and the stories of the past did not make them feel ashamed but made them stronger. It allowed them to have strong connections to their ancestry, which no matter how it was torn away, the stories and traditions that were passed down only helped the enslaved people. Along with this, their mere existence is a phantom in itself. Every space inhabited by Korah and the other enslaved characters is a place that is impacted heavily by their presence. She will leave behind a spectral story and her eventual escape from the plantation will be spread through story. It is important to recognize the places and structures built by the enslaved. They serve as great pillars to constantly show America their presence shall not be forgotten. Core, she thinks about stories told to her through word of mouth, in particular, the story of the day she is born. She says her mind tricked her and she'd turn the story into one of her memories, inserting the faces of ghosts, all the slave dead. 
The dead enslaved follow Cora and many, of, uh, many other enslaved women. Cora's mother is her ghost, her burden to carry, and it is not her mother's presence, but the lack thereof, and the story that comes along with her absence that makes Cora the perfect partner for Caesar to bring on his journey to freedom. Cora's mother was presumed to have ran away, leaving Cora behind. She was the only slave to escape successfully from the Randall Plantation, although she never really escaped. She never meant to even leave her child. She was killed in a swamp not too far from Cora. However, her absence was seen as an escape, and Cora inherited, inherited this blood, supposedly filled with freedom. This story fell upon her. She had no choice in receiving it, only what she would do with it. The novel is technically a work of fiction. The only truly fictional aspect of the story is Cora's is Cora's story, which is sure to have happened dozens of times to many different enslaved women and men. And the other aspect would be the railroad. Choosing to use a physical railroad to freedom instead of some other route to travel shows the impact of what Africans and African Americans did to this grand landscape. Cora states it when trapped in the attic of Martin's house in North Carolina. The only thing colored folks hadn't built was the tree. God had made that. Viewing this world from the attic, she refers to the lynching tree which the white people of the town have corrupted. They turned it into something malicious for cruelties, but this was the only work they put into town, was instilling ideas of, of hatred. Many of the magnificent wonders of this world were built through slave labor, the houses erected by enslaved people, the statues carved in honor of those that wanted to see a continuation of the system is a mark on this land's history, showing its atrocious upbringing on the backs of other human beings. Yet there is one architectural feat, and this is the railroad. The railroad is, made one, is one made out of necessity, but more importantly, free will. It is in the novel to show the majesty of these laborious workers, its dark tunnels weave underneath the American soil. Many enslaved people escape from the jaws of the oppressor. It haunts those that wish to keep freedom out of their reach. It acts as a threat to so many on top. When Cora asked the conductor who built it, it is simple to understand when he responds with, who builds anything in this country? The physical structures are something to admire. I still thoroughly enjoyed our family traditions, but they would become sprinkled with more mature topics of myself and my place in the world. My identity had partially been shaped by the cinema. When I was younger, I looked at the wide worlds of many movies, and I badly wanted to be the characters within them. I wanted to be Luke in Star Wars, and I wanted to be Iron Man, intelligent and powerful. There was a striking difference between me and my favorite heroes. Even at a young age, I saw the color of my skin was drastically different from these heroes. Instead of being at the front, I would have to be second best. I could only be the sidekick of Iron Man, War Machine, or Mace Windu, the Black Jedi. Granted, these characters were not bad at all. In fact, they gave me a sliver of hope that I would, could become even greater than the white leads of Hollywood. My blackness was sculpted by movies, and it eventually became a large part of our post and pre-movie discussions. My identity and who I w was became topic for discussion based off of the representation of people, in people of color in Hollywood. It's gotten better over the years, but it still needs a lot of work. Playa Vista is very close to my happy little nest in Ladera in Culver City. Mama Bird lives in Culver City and a biking distance away resides Papa Bear in Ladera. Playa Vista is a fa fair distance away from both houses. It creates a fine little triangular domain. In Playa Vista, there are bright apartment buildings that are much taller than they are wide. Next to these Jenga-styled abodes sits a shopping center with many fine restaurants and other commodities. Perhaps the most important is the theater. We arrive an hour before our scheduled showing. Our party consists of me, my sister, and my father. After driving in circles searching for a parking spot, we come across a space with two signs telling us, parking for moving trucks only. My dad refusing to give up when a piece of plastic tells him to. He states, go move the sign. He seems to have got, forgotten where we are. So jokingly, I respond, this will either end in me getting shot or your car being towed. He cranes his neck to give me the look that says, move the gosh darn sign, except he doesn't mean gosh darn. <laughs> Hesitantly, I step out of the car and secure this all sought out for a parking spot. When we walk into the food court, it smells of bread, meat, and cheese. The lights are strewn across the skyline, reminding me of some sort of fair. The braziers are lit and the children waltz around the glass walls. I wish I could say it was all walks of life, but the place is populated by many white families. Nothing I haven't seen before, of course. We were the second family of color in the burger place, and the rest were all servers. 
We settle down next to a fountain shell. The streams of water unenthusiastically arc out of the exposed faucets. Although there is a color to the water, its color is spotty at best and fades the longer one stares. The fountain slaps against the water as my sister tells me about her day. Today in class, we talked about police brutality. Things have just taken a serious turn from a fun night out at the movies to another one of the more mature and serious days where we get to sit down and talk about our standing in the country. My sister cuts back into my thoughts. So this girl said, we should just get rid of all police. Of course, I expected her to naively agree with the girl, so I butt in saying, well, you know, we need police officers to keep law. However, she snaps back with a smirk as though she had beaten a chess master at her own game. I know we need the police to keep order. Almost happy with how the conversation is going, I mentioned one very important fact, although we could do without the racist ones. I find it so overwhelmingly difficult to discuss topics such as this one in other environments, because I don't know, when I want to talk about the injustices many police officers have committed, people think, oh well, he thinks all cops are racist, or he just doesn't have enough respect for those who keep us safe. I realize that not all police officers act like this, but it is my belief that a majority of the officers look at black youth and see criminals, hoodlums, and harlots. When one has this state of thinking it is, and is given the power to do what they will, most will lash out. I do understand our need for police, but I also understand our more pressing need of police reform. There are just too many innocent black men and women being targeted and killed by criminals who hide as our heroes. Another reason why I find this so important is so my sister, who is with me always, doesn't have to grow up in a place where she has to work twice as hard because she is black, then yet another twice as hard because she's a girl. It's unjust, and if I can do anything to help break down the malicious minds of this world, I will come at it with all of my skills. She deserves to live in a world that loves her just as much as the next. During the era in which Underground Railroad takes place, there is no shame in the people's malicious activities. They are birthed into a world made for them. Yet Whitehead must uses to weave other truths of the current day and age into his, into his writing. The white people of the book are seemingly living a lie, as they truly believe that this way of life of how, is how it is supposed to be. Ridgeway, the yin to Korra's yang, is the main slave catcher after Korra. He has a personal vendetta against Korra because he was in charge of finding her mother. Ridgeway gives an interesting perspective to the writing, giving viewpoints of the oppressor side through conversation instead of violence. Ridgeway says if enslaved people were supposed to have their freedom, they wouldn't be in chains. If the white man wasn't destined to take this new world, he wouldn't own it now. It is this belief that things are perfectly natural that makes it so hard for many to cope with the scar in the country. It is a lie that is told to the oppressors, perhaps to make their crimes easier to swallow. Cora is one of the few characters who can see and speak on the truth. Nobody wanted to speak on the true disposition of the world, and no one wanted to hear it, certainly not the white monsters. It is this monologue of truth that strikes fear into the naysayers. Those in America show no shame and are quite blissful with their treatment of enslaved people and those that wish to harbor them. It is this that prevents them from moving forward. Literature such as Underground Railroad is so important to address the situation and those impacted head on. This way, citizens can move on to perhaps a better land that lives up to its promises of freedom for all. Korra is helped by many of the souls that acknowledge the horrors of the world with shame and respect. Yet their shame didn't, dr yet their shame didn't drive them aw away. It drove them to change. Korra says America was a ghost in the darkness like her. But it doesn't have to be hidden history. By showing remorse for the historic cruelties and hope for the liberty of all, Americans can be at peace with the shameful haunting of slavery. When I bring race into things, many people sigh as if to say, oh my God, we get it, you're black. But it is not my fault. So many aspects of my everyday life are intertwined with my race and ethnicity. It is a subject that is a part of me whether I like it or not. I noticed throughout the night my experience that that night may have been different had I not been aware of my blackness. If I weren't black, I wouldn't have went in having a conversation about race with a young future leader. If I weren't black, I wouldn't have witnessed the trailer for Black Panther as out of the ordinary. My race impacts me more than most, but if I can share my experiences, then perhaps I can open eyes to what it is like to talk about these topics constantly. For now, I will continue talking about my experience about being biracial, and after the night, I realized how important its presence is for me. I'll continue to talk about these issues until they no longer affect me.
Next up, Leon Quo from Flint Ridge Prep. I, to give some background on this personal narrative, um, it grew out of an assignment we had in ninth grade English class this year where our prompt was to explore our own culture and identity through an object like the short stories that we had just read. Here's halfway. I'm surrounded by a sea of bright lights and a mob of people, each with their eyes on the next place they want to go. A myriad of smells fills the dark, humid sky. I'm in Siling Night Market on vacation in Taiwan. Even as I transverse across borders, I still carry a constant uneasiness with me. I'm an, I am a foreigner in both Taiwan and the U.S. I grew up in the U.S. with carrying with me an American education, but my heritage is deeply rooted in Taiwan. In America, I try to preserve my own culture, but sometimes conformity is inevitable. Here, surrounded by my own culture, I still feel alienated and different. When I was little, I thought it was pretty cool that I was Taiwanese and was growing up here in the U.S. One time, I proudly told my family at dinner, I'm so glad we got to grow up here and still have all of our culture with us. I feel like we're living the best of both worlds. Unfortunately, my view quickly changed. I caught a glimpse of what our society is like during lunchtime. One day in third grade, I brought stewed pork rice to school. I was so proud to take out my lunch. The steam of the steam of the rice brought out the savory flavor of the pork that my mom had painstakingly made the night before. The pork was a golden brown after the hours of slow cooking it had gone through and was cut e into even small cubes. Every grain of rice below shimmered, showing the time she put in washing and soaking it. I beamed as I opened it, excited to enjoy. I could not even take a bite of it before my classmates, that I considered my friends, came up to me and said, Ew, is that even food? How can you eat that? I stared at them, not comprehending their words. How could they say that? My friends that I had grown up with. I cried on the way home, confused and upset. Mom, I managed to say, choking through the tears, can we buy Lunchables on the way home? I tried to breathe slowly to steady my voice, to no avail. What's wrong? Why do you want Lunchables all of a sudden? She asked. The tones of her warm voice and feeling of her soft touch on my shoulder made me want to explain everything to her. My classmates said that my food was gross today. Why don't they like it, Mommy? And even if they don't, why do they bother me about it? She clutched my small hand and squeezed it and said, they just don't understand. They didn't grow up with the same foods and culture. Now in high school, I realize that the same problems have not gone away. Stop speaking Asian, they say. Do you even know English? Where are you really from? Sometimes it comes out of nowhere. I'll be talking on the phone with my grandparents on the way home when a funny classmate comes in mockingly saying Ching Chong Ming Mong and pretends that they're on the phone too. Other times, I'll be walking to my locker when someone points to the geometry textbook in my hand and smirks, aren't you Asian? Why aren't you in pre-calc? Even when I'm not in the classroom, I hear about certain remarks that teachers have made about me. For example, once the printer was broken and started printing random symbols and at signs. Oh, Leon must be printing something in Chinese, she said. Other times, it's more offensive. Once, one of my teachers purposely mixed up all of the names of the Asian kids and said to another classmate, they're all the same anyway, right? Almost always, I smile and pretend that everything is fine. Over the years, I have learned to keep my mouth shut. 
my parents have also tried to give me comfort. 是白人的天下，在美国，我们永远是外国人。It's a white man's world. In America, we will always be foreigners. 跟华人交朋友就没有问题了。Just be friends with the Chinese kids. You'll have no problem in that case. Ever since that incident in third grade, I've learned to accept the fact that I do not belong. I am trapped between two worlds, not fully in one or the other. According to certain people in both the U.S. and Taiwan, I will never be one of them. They see me forever as an outsider, a foreigner. In America, I am not a typical teenager in any sense. I am as Asian as they come, with a personality and native language that matches. I have black hair and brown eyes. I do not listen to the pop and rap that characterizes the top 50s list that my friends go crazy for. For me, it's just too loud, too violent. My Spotify is filled with a mix of popular and older Chinese songs, some that I listened to when I was little, some new ones. I stumble when I'm asked what my favorite foods are, usually landing on pizza to go along with what everyone else says. I've tried to explain what my favorite foods actually are, only to meet confused or disgusted looks. If I were in Taiwan, it'd be different. I often think to myself. Now I sit alone in a crowded night market in Taiwan, waiting for a bowl of stewed pork rice that I had shed so many tears for during my childhood. Yet when my beloved dish finally comes, I feel no peace. Just like that time in third grade, I could not take a bite before I hear, "He is not A B C." That kind of very naive is not going to speak Chinese. Is he an A B C, an American-born Chinese, one of those arrogant kids who don't know a word of Mandarin? It is. It looks like it. I think so. You can just tell by looking at him. I feel betrayed by my own people. Could I ever find acceptance anywhere, or will I be a foreigner wherever I go? When I come back here to Taiwan, I am still different. I stick out like a sore thumb. Wherever I go, I'm looked at differently. Why? Sometimes I wear different clothes. I do everything to show that I am as Taiwanese as them too. But for some reason, they see through me. Once, when I was in elementary school, I visited a summer camp to see a close friend. He was still in class, so I brought Harry Potter to pass the time. A few other kids passed by me, pointed, and made comments. "Why, Gordon, a foreigner," they said. I turned back to my stewed pork rice, still warmish. Among the endless conversations in Chinese, I hear English. Two tourists. I assume from the U.S. try to order my treasured meal. Two pork rice bowls, please. They request. The lady at the counter stares, confused. They try to pull up an image on their phone, but discover that they have no signal. I stand up, slowly walking over. Ai, they want two bowls of roast beef. Auntie, they want two bowls of the stewed pork rice. She turns abruptly, bewildered that this foreigner could speak. You speak Mandarin? I nod, beaming. The two tourists pat me on the back. Thank you. 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 I've always still had some pride in being able to switch between English and Chinese. It's not my first time translating for someone, and it definitely won't be my last. I walk back to my stewed pork rice, now completely cold. I accept the fact that I will never be fully American or fully Taiwanese, but I'm fine with that. I am who I am, in part due to my heritage. But also the environment and culture I grew up in. I have two completely disparate worlds to explore, both equally in reach. 
I smile, taking a bite of the perfect medley of pork and rice. Thank you. And the final speaker in this panel is David Palomino from the Brentwood School. Hi. Just going to see if my presentation is here. Oh. Whoa. <laughs> I'm going to be talking about this book, The Epic of Gilgamesh, the oldest piece of literature in human history. <clears throat> The first stone tablet of Mesopotamia's ancient tale, the first work of literature in all of human history, begins as follows. It is an old story, but one that can still be told, about a man who loved and lost a friend to death and learned he lacked the power to bring him back to life. It is the story of Gilgamesh, and his friend in Kidu, from the Epic of Gilgamesh, 2150 BCE. I know the exact page of Gilgamesh describing how speaking to the dead feels like throwing words motionless into the air, accustomed to silence. I know the exact page on which the narrator describes the unfamiliar gravity of loss, leaving one amiss the new debris. Those pages in their raw and deeply personal immediacy remind me of tragedy in my life. Four of my uncles were gunned down in my grandparents' backyard, and I remember holding candlelight vigils on the very spots my grandmother had mopped up the blood. Since then, I have confronted grief and grappled with the confusing nature of my fragile mortality. Numbing, unanswerable questions have carved themselves into my existence just as the ancient Sumerians carved their verses into stone. Why did my loved ones have to die? Why must I stomach the bitter sickness of regret of words left unspoken? Who am I to live my life when my loved ones past cannot live and enjoy their own? I am not alone in asking these questions. No one is. Therein lies the greatness of Gilgamesh. Facing that ancient kinship of pain and sorrow, I find it poetic and fitting that the earliest work of literature is the raw and personal story of a human who loved and lost and reconciling with that death of a friend. What can be more human than the love one feels for another and the pain of having that loved one snatched from this earth? As I followed Gilgamesh's futile journey to bring his friend back to life, I finally found words to express what I had been feeling all along. All that is left to one who grieves is convalescence, the narrator describes. I realized that there is no beautiful forgetting. There is no sudden happiness that stitches the patches of the soul back together. No, there is only convalescence, that slow, gradual recuperation of strength with every passing day. One cannot arrive to healing without rest. You will never find an end to grief by going on in sorrow, an old woman told the weeping Gilgamesh. I felt as if she were speaking to me. Cherish your rest, she seemed to tell me. You are a thing that carries so much tiredness. I will never know why my loved ones were killed. I will never know if death is a matter of divine planning or a matter of wanton destruction. I will never know a million things, but, if, but I must understand that if I am to enjoy the simple rests I am afforded and the time I am allotted, I must accept that I may never know the answers to my questions for sure. Through Gilgamesh, I learned that the weight of loss doesn't disappear. The weight of loss just becomes easier to bear. The ending of Gilgamesh touches upon the brevity, but also the power of the moments the weight of loss seems to disappear. And for a moment, just a moment, all that lay behind Gilgamesh passed from view. 
the moments when my past sorrow laid behind me instead of ahead of me were triumphs. And little by little, those triumphs mounted. I noticed it like one notices the subtle shifts of the night turning into dawn. I became warmer, my view became brighter, and the haunting sounds of the night, the haunting brush of my memories, subsided just enough, just enough, to become a part of me without conquering me. Thank you. Thank you for those intelligent and emotionally naked um, essays and poems. I'm sure people if I get this off, have questions they'd like to ask the panelists. Um, OK, so this is for everyone, if you feel like answering. But a lot of you talked about like your individual experiences as far as like being different and different things of that nature. So how do you? I guess, deal with that now that you're accepting of that and I guess, in a sense, woke. I'd like to go first. I guess I embrace it now. Um, like I said, I've been going to my school for since I was six years old. And I mean, I was a kid where my friends would want to go to an expensive place for lunch. I did say like, oh, I actually can't go for this excuse, you know, when really I just couldn't afford it. Um, now I'm not afraid. I'm on financial aid. I'm, I embrace it. And I think that's the biggest struggle, is that especially at private schools, it's the school has an idea that will become like a salad bowl of different perspectives and ideas and kids from all over. But really what it is is this place where everyone wants to act like they belong there and act like they have money. So over the years, my awakening was really just me learning to embrace my circumstance, who I am, the fact that I can't afford to pay full tuition, but really embrace that. And that's where I'm able to tell my story and grow. Um, well, for me, I, I sort of grew accustomed to <coughs> the pushback of, of, of being sort of different, being the different one in the room. Um, and, and it's it's quite exhausting for for many people, but I I, I enjoy engaging in, in conversations of, of discourse and, and like disagreement because when I can thoroughly back myself up and and maybe even convince the opposing side to to sort of switch on over to to my viewpoint, I I know then if I can do that 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 it's right. So when I walk into a room and I realize that I, that I'm different and I'm standing out. I, I, I sort of embrace that. Like, like you said. Um, my poems were a little different, I think. Um, then I just want to say, like, I commend, I really commend everyone at this table. I think it's, like, really, really cool that um, you guys were able to use the first person and, like, really own your story and tell it. And I kind of am not, I don't think, quite at that point. So I use my poetry um, usually in third person and usually through stories that don't, directly connect to myself to like say things about myself that I maybe am not yet like brave enough to just outright be like this is my story. Um, so I just think it's really awesome that like everyone at this table is really like, claiming their identity. Yeah, so my poems were I would say also a little bit different because the difference that I talked about of being like a ginger isn't in any way um, leading to discrimination or any kind of a disadvantage is really like an innocuous thing. And so I think, for me at least, just through looking at difference, um, I think when it comes to a, like general like body positivity, I think that's really just kind of an internal process, and it's something that the outside um, world can't really affect. And that's mostly what I was trying to explore through this poem: is like, do I need to figure out where exactly I get these traits from in order for me to be happy with them, or can I really just accept that that's kind of um, how I am, but I don't need to trace them? And so, um, yeah, this is kind of I think. It's really an innocuous difference, and I think kind of being okay with not tracing it um, was what came out of was what came out of this poem and how I view that difference. So um, I think in America, on the topic of discrimination, um, things are obviously still it's still a problem, and I think that if there's more awareness and acceptance of other people from different backgrounds and from different cultures, we can work towards a society where 
everybody is viewed at in the same way. Um, I also think that sometimes um, the comments that people might make that can be interpreted as racist or discriminatory aren't necessarily from like a mal from malice, more from ignorance. And I think that collectively, if all of us just put a little bit more thought to the words that we say, then we can all build a better society together. I was in fifth grade when my uncles were killed. And I remember not completely understanding what had happened. I. I didn't understand and I was confused as to why such good people could be wiped off the place of the earth. But the thing that I, well, another thing that I didn't understand and that separated me from the other kids when I was in fifth grade was that many of them hadn't experienced loss. And if they did, it wasn't in the way that I had. It wasn't as violent. It's equally tragic. Every life's gone, gone, but it, not many people can say that four of their uncles were killed in one night. And so I remember my teacher in fifth grade telling everyone that my four uncles had, had been killed in a car crash. And I sat there on the back side of the room wondering why, they had, why she had to say it that way. Children don't understand, and I was going to a private school. My four uncles had been killed in a rough part of the neighborhood that no one had ever visited. But coming to terms with how I was different, not only in the place that I was at, but the things that happened to me was a very hard thing to come to grips with as a fifth grader. And so what I was looking for in trying to find an identity for myself was finding emotions or other people that had felt the same. And so when I stumbled upon this book, you know, on a bookshelf a couple of years ago and saw, like I say in this paper, I saw an ancient kinship that linked all people together. We all face the inevitable day when our experience is ended. And so seeing that really just made me very happy that we all knew. We have time for one more question, if anyone has one. Hi. First of all, I would like to just commend the whole panel. Amazing group of people. <laughs> we actually cover the whole continent of the world. And when I, as I see you guys, I'm just impressed. The future ahead of us is going to be one that is going to be full of amazing challenges and creativity that the world will just be shocked. Um, I, the question I want to say is that how are you going to handle the attention and the fame mm -hmm. and the greatness that all of you possess at this moment in time? Just looking at you, I can see our future is going to be so bright. Financially, it's going to be successful. We're going to be clear state in terms of money. We're going to have it. <laughs> <laughs> and creativity, the poems, wow. You know, and the unique perspective of life. You guys got it. Do you want to, a couple of you just, how do you, yeah, where do you go from here with what you've brought up in your, in your poetry and, and essays and personal stories? I think I touched on it a bit um, when I answered the first question, but I think like the next step for me um, is kind of straying away from like surrealism, which I kind of use as maybe like a blanket. Um, and just really doing what um, like I heard done here today, which is be just unabashed in um, sharing aspects of your lives that might not be palatable or attractive to other people. And also like just using, um, like it just made me realize like I, the way I look, I can go anywhere and fit in um, and I've like, done that. I mean, I've definitely taken advantage of the fact that I blend in 
um, really easily. And I think to just um, recognize that and then use that like privilege or that whatever to to shed light on like other issues, like s a lot that we're talking about here today, would be really cool. Because like to quote Desmond Tutu. Um, if you're neutral in times of injustice, you take the side of the oppressor. So. So yeah, kind of going with what Helen said, I think with poetry specifically, because I, I actually normally, this poem was kind of different than the majority of what I write because I normally don't write about myself really. And I think part of what makes poetry so cool is that you can really express emotion in a really raw and accessible way for anyone to read. And Helen quoted um, Richard Sykin in her poem, and he's one of my favorite poets because he can do that in such an effective way that can really reach people and creates kind of a common experience that mirrors, I think, um, the kind of emotions that we've kind of talked about in all of our presentations. Um, and so I think with poetry, and honestly, like I think poetry is kind of undervalued, and I think it's something that um, like can be such an important way for people to process emotions. So I encourage anyone who's even like remotely interested to check out. Um, any poetry because it's like just so cool and it can really like, change the way you think about the world but also just like sharing poetry with other people um, has been a really important part of my life over the last few years especially since I started reading poetry um, we have like a poetry club at our school and we do a lot of like sharing poetry especially surrounding themes so we'll have like a day where we talk about like feminist poetry or a day where we talk about um, like poetry about loss or any kind of themes that can be conveyed through few words, but through words that are really powerful. So that's what I love about poetry, and that's what I hope to continue um, kind of pursuing, I guess. So. Um, so tying it back to some of the comments that I've um, received from my peers, I think that um, if everybody takes a stand, and if you if you hear something that can that might be a little bit borderline discriminatory. I encourage everybody to stand up for your peers because this issue is something that we should be talking about. And to do that, we need to stand up for our peers for change to happen. So personally, um, I'll try my best to, um, when it's not just my personal sake, but for other people to stand up when something is said that isn't right. What's next is a good question, because I'm always thinking of what's next. The resounding answer I always come to is, I have no clue. <laughs> <laughs> but what I find as a thread linking all the books I read in my spare time is this urgent need to find myself somewhere within the pages and to come to terms with the words that are said, the philosophies that are expressed, and to see if I can apply anything from this book into my life. I've, I like to think that I do that with all the novels I read, but I've been doing that a lot recently with ancient literature, from Gilgamesh to El Cid, one of the first Spanish epic poems. So what's next is just to continue finding myself in the literature that I read. It's a lifelong quest. Um, for me, yeah. Um, for me, it's it's the next step for me is going to be, I guess, taking finding more discourse, places where I can be sort of challenged mentally or having pushback against against my ideas, where so I can defend my ideas and beliefs, and if the other side is able to convince me otherwise possibly taking a step back and looking at myself or trying to convince the other side. Um, and I think also taking critique as well uh, to, to be able to be open-minded in, in changing how I write and, and sort of walk through the world. Um, for me, probably, you know, I know I wouldn't be able to tell my story today if it wasn't, wasn't for the mentors in my life that gave me support. Um, so I think really being able to embrace myself now and be who I am, I think it's my duty to be a mentor and support others. You know, it's sad at school to see freshmen who are still, you know, embarrassed to say they're on financial aid. Um, so I think really it's 
my job as someone who's older and has embraced myself to give more support to every student, you know, and to continue to tell my story. All right. So we are going to break for lunch. We're, we're over time a little bit, so it's going to be a fairly quick lunch. We're going to do about 20 to 25 minutes. Um, so I encourage you guys to uh, engage with each other. Um, lunch is just back there, and uh, we'll renew uh, after lunch with another panel. <laughs>